2015 Microsoft Research. He studies cryptography and information security, in particular using powerful cryptographic tools such as zero-knowledge proofs to achieve privacy and integrity in distributed systems. He also studies privacy risks and side-channel attacks. He heads Tel Aviv University's Lab for Experimental Information Security and is a founding scientist of the Zcash cryptocurrency. So yeah, without further ado, please, uh, Aurel and Erhan, please. I just want to say that we need a note taker. So, you know, I give ah, yeah. this fina final encouragement to everybody. This is the last session that we need a note taker for in all of the workshop. So far, we've gotten one for every session. So um, please do, do uh, suggest yourself in the chat or to Isaac or, or Benedict. Uh, we'll, remem we'll remind it uh, before the discussion if, in case there is no one. Um, yeah, ideally, right, ideally would be if we have someone now, uh, this would be great because then we can have notes for both the talk and the discussion. So, um, okay. Please just type in the chat and uh, we would be forever thankful. Aurel and Eran, it's all yours. So, Eran, I will uh, share these slides and just uh, let me know when you want to switch. Uh, Eran, are you with us? Oh, we can't hear you, Eran. Hello? That's good now. Okay, so uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we are near the end of the conference uh, and we get to, to discuss the interface, which is joint work with the colleagues on the side. Um, Zeki interface, uh, next slide please, aims to uh, address the following need in uh, zero knowledge proofs. And um, that need is given numerous implementations uh, that fulfill different parts of the pipeline of producing zero knowledge proofs. How can we allow people to mix and match different parts of the pipeline in a compatible way? Uh, more concretely, uh, we have front end and back ends where the front ends uh, produce statements and uh, encode them in some intermediate language. And the back ends take those statements as well as witnesses for those statements and produce proofs. And these are really very different tasks. For the back ends, the task is a cryptographic task doing multi exponentiations and Fourier transforms and loading re extensions and getting all the crypto right. Whereas the high level of the front end is a programming language task. Uh, as well as various uh, algebraic optimizations and tricks. Um, and if we could make them uh, interoperable, then we would allow people to pick their favorite programming languages and favorite uh, algebraic tricks for representing their statements and just write them down, let someone else do the crypto. And conversely, allow someone to write the best zero knowledge proof scheme and, ha and make it usable by numerous uh, front ends that would uh, act as clients for that. Um, Zika interface tries to provide that common language. And by now we have numerous front ends. What you have in this slide is definitely a partial list as well as numerous back ends. And uh, I will mention a few of these as we go. I will also explain the color coding, but quantitatively just looking at the slide, we see there is a need. Um, in the next slide, we'll discuss some nuances of the need. So uh, we need some concrete formats for front ends to convey their statements, that is instances and witnesses, as well as relations uh, to the back end. And we need them to agree not just on the format, but also on what the format means. For example, uh, if you have a bunch of variables being assigned to, then there needs to be some clear semantics to what is the ordering and, or naming of the variables uh, in order for uh, different back ends to interpret things the same way. Uh, we need to address the issue of uh, witness reductions, the procedure that takes a high level witness like 
uh, say you're dealing with set membership and a high level witness may be a Merkle authentication path. And somehow that needs, needs, that needs to be converted to something very low level like variable assignments uh, involving a procedure. How do we represent such procedures uh, in a way that does not force people to provide the code for that procedure in any spe specific way, but rather is agnostic to the language and framework. How do we enable um, a modular construction using so-called gadgets? And how do we allow all of these to be done even when they are generated on the fly by different interoperating, interoperating frameworks? So this is a tall goal. Um, and uh, moreover, we have various constraints and considerations in, um, a, in achieving it in the next slide. Um, so we want to indeed be agnostic to frameworks and programming languages. Experience has shown that almost everyone approaching zero knowledge has very distinct and particular tastes in frameworks and languages and uh, tends to write their own front end uh, and we want to support that. Um, we want to allow a modular gadget that can nonetheless be used across these implementations so that one front end uh, that is written in some very fancy functional language that is clearly the best in the world can nonetheless use uh, some implementation of say highly optimized hash function provided by the barbarians who use C++, for example. Um, we want to, keep, to do all of this using minimal overhead. Um, they, basically, we don't even want data to be duplicated too many times and copied across processes uh, or memory or, or disk, uh, let alone uh, any heavy, more heavyweight uh, transformations uh, from uh, different representations. Uh, we want to make sure that this remains attractive even to people who care deeply about performance because snark generation is on the critical path in some applications. Um, there's also a challenge in regard to the level of abstraction. Clearly the highest level abstraction, the more simplified we make things, the easier it is to do uh, interoperable implementations. But conversely, we are sometimes forced to reveal low level details like you know, the choice of field, the, um, um, the or curves, the, uh, the cost metrics and so forth. Um, in order to allow people to optimize. So there's uh, a challenge there. And lastly, uh, but very impor importantly, uh, we want an approach that goes, uh, that can plausibly support the uh, numerous styles of constraint system representation out there, uh, including our ncs but also the many other things that people uh, on this, uh, in this conference have been discussing. Um, next slide, please. So here's where we are right now. Um, ZK interface uh, available on GitHub, uh, it's a given URL, um, is basically a calling convention that defines messages that backends and frontends can exchange in order to agree on a constraint system. Currently, for R1CS. It defines how such messages are serialized, so they can be sent between different implementations. It defines the protocol by which these um, messages should be exchanged and how the semantics of their interpretation. Uh, it gives various uh, in, uh, recommendations for how to implement uh, these calling conventions from both the producing and consuming side. And it also provides a, a number of adapters for uh, many of the popular front ends and back ends, allowing them to produce and consume these messages and thereby interoperate. interoperate. Um, concretely, for example, one thing you can find in the GitHub repo is a, a, is a demo running in browser using WebAssembly that demonstrates integration of Socrates and Bulletproof. Um, if we look at the next slide, we'll see more systematically uh, the Green annotations are those front end and back ends for which adapters already exist, written either by us or by the authors of the corresponding systems. And uh, that means that if you are one of the um, orange uh, shapes and don't have an adapter yet, and if you do write your adapter, then suddenly you will be able to talk to all the green guys on the other side. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, 
Now, there are many names here that, of systems that may be familiar to you. There are two that may be familiar only to some of you. Uh, those are the CIVTA1 front-ends and CIVTA2 back-ends. This is a new thing. Uh, next slide, please. Oh. Um, this is a new thing that we'll discuss uh, two slides from now. Together. Do you want to talk about this? Uh, no, no, let's skip it over there, sorry. Uh, go to go back to uh, the table. This one? Yes, thank you. So uh, hold the thought on, on Civ. Um, regarding uh, the current proposal, well, uh, the current proposal reflects, of course, the implementation program, a, a progress since our previous proposal in this previous ZK proof. Um, and um, it, the revised proposal in this ZK proof uh, discusses if, if the needs for additional extension. Um, the following things are on the table if for uh, future extensions beyond the, uh, the progress I've already described. It includes uh, going beyond R1CS to arithmetic circuits, Boolean circuits, as well as uh, custom gates and exploiting uniformity. Uh, as we've heard, for example, in Ariel Gabizon's talk about a uh, Plonk and its generalizations, um, Aurel will say more about these. Um, we want to add a discussion of um, a proof techniques that involve multiple proofs that are bound together. Uh, we saw that in, for example, the discussions of uh, Lego snark and related techniques. Um, we would definitely like to say more about uh, deployment and execution and how these messages uh, are to be generated and where to find the binary or process that would generate the message that you would consume. How does it all come together in, in a way that is not merely well defined at the, the level of the communication, but also at the runtime environment. And of course, we uh, would like to see more adapters to other front ends and back ends. Uh, we'll dwell on all of these. Uh, just before we continue, I would like to mark certain things are out of scope tentatively. It's up for discussion, but these are difficult problems that we don't intend to uh, tackle right now. And that is um, the, the uh, what can be called snark adjacent primitives, uh, which are things like um, a accumulate improve, commit improves, the things you can do outside the snark to reduce the, the burden on the constraint system itself. We know these are very useful. Schemes like uh, Zcash sapling make extensive use of these, uh, but they seem more difficult to uh, handle in a generic way. Ideas would be welcome. Another thing that we are still keeping out of scope is interoperability between backends, meaning having one implementation produce a proof that another independent implementation can consume, and they would be bit compatible and have everybody would agree on exactly what are the curve, what is the scheme, what is the uh, ser ser serialization format for the actual proof themselves. Uh, would definitely be useful, but it's mostly orthogonal to the current effort. Um, there, there's a lot of work that can be done at the level of programming langu languages at, at, the at the front end in the fancy frameworks that would introduce type safety features and uh, a, a programming language techniques for composition of gadgets. Um, this sits above the interface um, and uh, is partially orthogonal and also definitely not agnostic and therefore out of scope. Um, next slide, please. Going back to DARPA save. Um, so DARPA Save is a new program initiated by DARPA on securing information for encrypted verification and evaluation, which is a very nice acronym uh, for something that means make ZK useful. And ZK make it useful not just for the class of applications that uh, we have seen successful so far, which tends to have very simple statements, but rather the focus is on much richer and larger statements things like proving vulnerability of software or proving the security of software, kind of statements that may involve reasoning about a long execution of a complicated x86 program and the way that some buffers are 
um, overridden and uh, new instructions come in. And you can imagine the number of constraints it takes to basically have an X86 interpreter. Um, and uh, we want to make that useful. Uh, other examples would be more abstract reasoning about programs as well as all sorts of uh, important computation that comes up in a socially significant setting uh, that we would like to ensure the integrity of all properties of. So DARPA decided that this is important for its mission broadly defined to have such tools available and is funding uh, many groups uh, in academia and industry. Uh, many of these are represented in this uh, crowd, I believe. Um, and um, these two, these groups produce their own uh, front ends and back ends, front ends for the applications, back ends for the crypto. Uh, technically, these are called TA1 and TA2, respectively. Um, and uh, they need to talk together. The different groups need to, need to operate, which sounds very much like the story from our first slide. But now there's an actual urgent need to do that and moreover to exercise all of the scalability as well as agnosticism features that uh, we have enumerated earlier. So this is really a, a huge use case, I would say even stress case for our approach. Uh, it also requires us to accommodate backends that are not QAP R1CS based um, and, um, a, thereby, and therefore extend ZK interface to handle that. So with all of this in mind, uh, you would like to uh, dive into uh, the specific questions on the table and to garner people input on what they think about the importance and the technical approaches to achieving these, as well as share our preliminary thoughts on these extensions. I will uh, let Aurel continue this discussion. Okay. Thank you, Iran. So I would like to introduce the details of how this actually works for uh, those of us who don't yet, who haven't seen it yet. And then we'll talk about the new ideas that we have and how we want to solve them. So let's take a simple case where we have a front end that uh, knows about the statements to be proven and the back end that knows about the cryptography to prove any uh, constant system or any statement. So we assume that they are different pieces of software and they communicate by sending a message. I don't know if you see my pointer or not. Uh, by sending messages and we define the messages and how they are transported. So there are typically two phases. Uh, one is to describe the, the statement or the constant system or the circuit, depending on your language. And the other phase is to, uh, so to generate the actual values that you want to prove about and that uh, prove that the constraints are satisfied, the witness, the assignment. So two phases. We don't define exactly uh, when and how they are to be shared because it depends on the proving system. Some need a pre-processing like uh, snarks. So in that case, the constraints are going to be used for the trusted setup, for instance, or maybe by MPC uh, software. And others are going to do everything at once and take both messages uh, to make a, a trustless pr proof. And we're going to talk about how to transport them later. The complicated flow now, building on top of that, is when you want front ends to talk to each other. That means the front end has an implementation for some uh, useful functionality, maybe a hash function or a Merkle tree. Uh, and another is an application and wants to express his business logic and we use the, the components that already exists and that's what we want to, to achieve here. So that would be um, a circuit with some public input to the left and inside of this circuit it has its logic but it also connects to the inputs of some other gadgets that were implemented by someone else. Uh, potentially in another language and so on. So the idea here, the, the uh, end game is to create an ecosystem. So to have the ability to uh, go to GitHub or NPM or Cargo, something like this, and be able to find packages and that they work out of the box. 
to, today we are as a community we're kind of uh, many people are experts and they are capable of doing everything so and generally they prefer to have one compact uh, monolithic uh, approach that is uh, the most optimized but as the community grows uh, i believe that uh, there will be a lot of value in uh, in sharing code and reusing gadgets and things working out of the box with some sort of uh, common like just import gadgets and, and such that will save a lot of work to a lot of people so how do we implement it the flow looks a little bit more complicated, but it's uh, really the same as the simple one. So we have the front end and the back end. And now we have another kind of front end, which is uh, seen as a library that you might want to use, and you might have multiple of those. So the front end still sends its constraints during the setup phase, if any, and it still sends its assignment slash witness uh, in order to generate a proof. But it also asks to some other software components to generate its own. So let's say the gadget is a hash function. The front end of the main uh, kind of application secret is going to ask the other piece of software to uh, please generate all the constraints and all the witness uh, values for the hash function based on the input from, from the main program and add those constraints to the proof, to the backend. So the backend doesn't have to know it, it just uh, accumulates, and it just aggregates all the constraints. So they can be concatenated, because the, the order doesn't really matter. So add your constraints, and that uh, together generates a big uh, constraint system. And same for the value, whatever temporary or intermediary values you need for your hash function, uh, give it to the backend so that it can go into computing the proof. There's also a return path because uh, the gadget might be interesting. The gadget, for instance, for the hash function is the best place to know how to compute the digest, for instance. So it might return the variable that contains the digest uh, value. So it's, it's a lot more convenient for the uh, main front end to continue using it. And of course, we can do recursion. This gadget can call another. So the formats, we are using a schema. So don't, don't worry about the exact, uh, this is just an extract of it. So there's a schema for the variables and there are um, three types of messages defined today. So this is to serve the uh, different settings, as I mentioned, with or without pre-processing, uh, direct uh, simple flow from front end to back end or between gadgets and so on. So you have all these different uh, ways to to use it and uh, the difference between all flows is which message you send at what time in, in a sense so in three types of messages uh, that enables so gadget composition uh, we are using for serialization so it, we defined uh, exactly what the serialization format is uh, we are not using the simplest possible solution which would have been maybe something familiar like json or, or such um, we are going for something a little bit more complicated that has this uh, interface definition uh, format. Uh, it's called flat buffers. It's similar to protobuf. It's also a Google project. And the advantage of it is that it's uh, performance. So it's possible to make an implementation with uh, zero overhead. So it, it, it's not just serialization format, it's actually a memory layout format. So if someone wants to bother to get very high performance, they can do like really very optimized uh, management of, of memory and so on. And it's, uh, it's also extensible. So if we can change the schema, add things, and uh, it's uh, well specified what will happen, you can find all the details on uh, the, our homepage. Now the extensions that we might want to, to make, uh, or that we definitely want to make actually. Currently we support R1CS. We like to evolve to uh, arithmetic and Boolean secrets. And by arithmetic secret, I mean uh, something that is uh, 
as a bounded fan in, for instance, a binary gate, so where the multiplication accepts only two variables and uh, defines a new variable as its output, unlike R1CS, which has a unbounded fan in, so every gate can connect to every variable. So that's what we would like to support because there are uh, many schemes that uh, use this uh, natively. And especially the uh, newer one, and especially projects. Uh, GC here means uh, garbled circuits. So uh, schemes that are based on MPC IDs, MPC in the head, garbled circuits and such. Uh, also the universal um, uh, CRS uh, schemes typically uh, use this, also bulletproof. So it's very interesting to support it. And it's very similar. So all the concept of variables or wire uh, can be reused. The value of all the encoding uh, logic uh, is about the same. Um, could even say that this is a subset of R1CS in some sense. Just need an extra marker about how to interpret the gates, uh, about what the limitations are, for instance, maximum uh, one input per, or two inputs per gate or such. Um, so that, that's uh, the interoperability uh, ID between R1CS and arithmetic circuits. So they are very similar, so probably we can, uh, like, we use most of the work and support both at the same time. Uh, we can maybe make an automatic converter. So this is definitely possible. You can apply a simple rule and you will have a conversion between one to the other uh, with a constant overhead. Yeah, this is a trivial converter. Um, there is one already for the bulletproof uh, implementation actually. And we could extract this and make it a tool and being reused so that you, your front end can emit R1CS and uh, go through the automatic conversion and use a uh, uh, magnetic secret uh, backend, for instance. Then we can also make it smarter, like find optimizations, because uh, uh, since the formats are different, uh, sometimes uh, something can be more efficient, more optimized in the, in the part in R1CS or, or the other way around. So there's no limit to how smart the converter can become. We are also interested in uh, multi-part proofs. That means proofs that combine both formats. Or we need two proofs with uh, two different proving system and we want to combine them together. So same discussion for Boolean circuits. It's uh, again, like almost a subset, it's very similar. You can say it's like uh, using a field of one bit and uh, specifying what the gate, uh, how to interpret the gate. So then there is um, another style, which is polynomial constraints and also custom gates. Uh, maybe Eran, do you want to comment on this? Um, yes, yeah, so these are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the kind of techniques that Ariel Gabizon mentioned in his talk about um, uh, the use of basically generalizations of the UAP style argument, these native languages R1CS, to support more complex relations between polynomials. Uh, Ariel showed several uh, specific uses for that, and we know that another usage pattern is custom gates that allows the uh, a constraint system to support certain operations, um, it's certain repeating op operations more efficiently, which is tremendously useful for a, a computations dominated by um, repeated a relatively expensive operations like um, in case of set membership, you would have many Pedersen hashes, you can support them using relatively very few constraints. It is, and analogously, if you were supporting uh, in other very uniform computation like a, a simulated CPU, um, then you can um, a, you create um, representations of the transitions function and amortize them. We saw an analogous discussion also in the context of uh, FRI-based TCP techniques and uh, AIR. Um, it's a different algebraic setting um, and we are still exploring commonalities between the two. 
Um, but we are definitely seeing a pattern where these techniques that uh, allow reasoning about a more complex polynomial than by, just by linear con constraints are uh, advantageous for structured computation. And we'd like to, to uh, have a intermediate language representation uh, that allows these to be conveyed between front ends and back ends. Uh, we would also allow, as uh, Aurel also mentioned, for arithmetic and Boolean circuits, um, to have fallbacks that translate between these more flexible, powerful representations and simple ones, namely I1CS, in order to allow easy interoperability with existing systems, even if the cost of, uh, uh, of the, that easy uh, conversion is not optimal. Um, great. So there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, do you guys want to continue with your presentation and we have them at the end or do you want to take maybe we'll take like two or three minutes uh, to answer these questions. What do you guys think around and around? Yes, uh, we can. Uh, we can because we're going to switch to another topic uh, after lunch. Okay, yeah. that's, uh, uh, that's what it seemed like. So. So maybe maybe let's have uh, we, we can ask actually have the people. Can I see it? Or I'll, I'll read the question, and then if there's more feedback, then the person asking the question can sort of unmute themselves and uh, come in. So Riyad asked that uh, having the front end produce variable assignment isn't the obvious decision, and indeed is that is not the way that many most current front end back end responsibilities are divided. Can you guys speak uh, to this choice and what alternatives you considered? Uh, let me take that one. Um, actually, I don't know of any current system that uh, doesn't effectively, can't effectively talk in terms of variable assignments. Uh, it seems to me that it's just a matter of where we put the interface line. Uh, but uh, would, would you like to elaborate, please, on uh, what you have in mind? Yeah, maybe we had, um you can uh, <clears throat> sure um, yeah. sure uh, so uh, hi this is Riyadh Iran um, nice to see you again uh, so the yeah I mean basically the idea is something like uh, look the it's not it's not totally obvious that, that the front end uh, as in the thing that produces the constraints um, is uh, should also be responsible for uh, producing the variable assignments. Another totally reasonable um, thing would be the front end produces two things, a constra constraint system and also a computation that given some concrete inputs produces variable assignments for the rest of the circuit, uh, right? So uh, I wonder about drawing the line exactly there because it seems like uh, there's actually another entity uh, that possibly could exist. And also, uh, you know, we, we think about these things operating at different times especially in the case of circuits for pre-processing, we, we think about, well, we run on the front end once and then we do some setup and blah, 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 blah. And then eventually we're gonna generate a proof and then we need to generate assignments. So it seems like the, we could leave the front end behind and, and now just have some, some other computation that we run. So it's, it's not okay. obvious to me for that reason. Well, uh, I mean, so in, in, this is really just a matter of semantics. Uh, we are talking about the same thing. Uh, we are just, uh, for the current discussion, bundling both the instance reduction and the witness reduction under what we call the front end, that is the ZK proof terminology so far. I totally agree that these, the front end can be broken into two parts in the way you described. And this is exactly why we put procedural generation of the variable assignment as an explicit uh, requirement from the system that allows support for this kind of thing. Great, that makes sense. Thank you, thank you very much for the answer. Yeah, so okay. this is exactly- sure we can uh, discuss this later. Yes. Yeah, okay. let's, let's go. go ahead. All right. Uh, actually, actually, part of my question follows on from that. So, yeah, when you're, uh, when you're compiling, for example, um, to TurboPlonk, you want to preserve enough information that you know what uh, custom gate to use. So, so for example, suppose you're doing um, a scalar multiplication. The most efficient way to do that is to have a, a block of the circuit that is just doing the scalar multiplication and it has a specific layout where you can, you don't have to use a general permutation argument. Um, so you don't want to compile the, the high level 
gadget too far so that the uh, back end has to basically undo part of that and recognize it as a, as a high level thing that it can optimize. Um, uh, yes, that, that is exactly why the extension of the uh, representation is needed to allow for uh, this higher level uh, representation that you described to be conveyed with the industrialized message format. And whereas conversion down to the dumb format, as well as automatic reconstruction may be useful in some cases, they are clearly not the optimal thing. Right, but, but you d also you don't want to have to say, define a new message for every new gate. You, you want something a bit more general than that at the ZK interface level. Yes. Yeah, and the, the other um, comment I had was, was comment more than a question was that um, uh, Bulletproof, Sonic and Halo, um, they're not really um, limited in front end, they, they just separate the multiplication gates yes. from the linear control. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I was thinking of the uh, multiplication gates and then, so yeah, and it, both It's types... actually pretty easy to translate between the ones yes, in the format. Exactly, right. it, should, it should fit uh, exactly in the same encoding even. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, and so I think it's... then, um, Mutu had one more question. Do you want to ask that? Sure. Uh, this is just probably more generally a comment. Um, is that, I mean, when I think of these zero knowledge statements and, you know, uh, Iran also brought up the, uh, the DARPA C uh, use case. I mean, there are very, very large statements and then there are small to medium uh, statements. And, you know, when it comes to very, very large statements, I don't, I mean, I don't particularly see if there are like applications where, oh, I want to optimize on uh, proof length. I mean, I want to probably run it in decent time, but in these cases, typically memory is going to be the bottleneck and you want something that is on the fly. Again, I should say I'm not a compiler person. So if I, you know, make some horrible uh, uh, mistakes with, uh, uh, with terminology, uh, I apologize. But I mean, you want something that is on the fly because you want the constraints to be built on the fly. You want the proof system also to be on, on the fly. So have you thought about this with respect to the interface, at least for very, very large statements? For smaller statements, again, it seems to me that you know you want to optimize on proof time and all these things, and you know you want to go into the nitty gritty details. You want to tailor make these things so that you get that performance. Like you want to run it, you know, web assembly. You want to run it on a browser, right? So, how does again? Uh, how do you view the interface with respect to these two things? Yes. So uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, the streaming uh, mode. So we don't have an implementation for it, but it's explicitly supported uh, by the specification and the format. That means that you can split your constraint system or your witness in uh, chunks as, uh, of the size that you choose and send them one by one as if the, on, on some kind of uh, channel on the pipe. If the backend supports this, yes, uh, this is possible with the existing uh, formats. And your other question was for small statements. So we do have a, a demonstration for WebAssembly uh, running. Um, yeah, so, but we are more concerned about large statements, I believe. But the format is very compact anyway, and so far it has very little overhead, be it a few messages or big ones, and it has a low overheads in all directions. So for the on the fly that you said, again, I don't know how compilers, you know, do these things for very large statements, but it seems to me, again, maybe I'm completely off base, is that you're restricting the way in which, you know, the, the front end and back end are going to communicate. And you want to leverage all the things that you've learned in compilers and on the fly design, right? You want something that's compatible with that kind of thing when you go from, uh, front end to back end. So how do you, uh, again, maybe this is more a question. Is it, is the way in which you're doing this restrictive or not? So we're trying not, not to have assumptions that would restrict uh, this, this sort of things. So the granularity right now is at the constraint uh, level. So 
we are basically optimizing for making it uh, as easy as possible to do a clean split. If you look at the compiler pipeline, I mean, it's starting from some fancy high level language all the way down to, um, a, to the underlying architecture, um, then it, it the amount of complexity and semantics and uh, the richness of the specification keeps fluctuating as you go. And um, we are looking for some spot very close to the uh, bare metal uh, of the architecture, so to speak, like our, the, our, our CS would be the analog, um, where um, you have already stripped most of the semantics and most of the things that compiler needs to deal with and can do fast, fancy optimization too. But you have preserved enough for the underlying backend to really ex flex its muscle uh, on the special tricks and optimizations and uh, ways that it can exploit uniformity and so forth. Um, for I1CS, it was particularly easy. Uh, and for the uh, things on the slides, it's going to be not nearly as easy. Um, um, but I think that staying close to uh, the, the edges or polynomial representations rather than reason about higher level abstractions is going to be very helpful. So maybe just one follow up and I don't want to hijack too much of the time and uh, I'll, I'll stop with this is that, I mean, this problem has been faced in, you know, the MPC community with the people doing garbled circuits, right? I mean, they have tried very large circuits. And uh, again, I don't know the works. I only know the work of Abi that has, you know, the bare metal is sort of an interpreter style, right? I mean, that way you don't have to unroll for loops and so forth, uh, which you probably want for very, very large statements, right? So uh, again, I'm not the authority in R1CS either, but I would be some of the features that you would need when it comes to very large, even for this bare metal, right? Uh, I agree. Uh, there's another part of the answer, which is uh, gadget libraries. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, to take your analogy to MPC, is that the state-of-the-art MPC techniques don't even have a well-defined, a simple uh, a, a representation like arithmetic circuits or Boolean circuits. Rather, they use all sort of circuit styles and they push parts of the computation outside the MPC and then have the kind of randomizations and, and checks inside the MPC to, uh, to do the binding. And, and it, but I mean, we could focus our discussion to garbled circuits, which is just Boolean computation. And it's probably this Nigel's format that most people use, right? Like I'm saying, we could, I mean, just to, just for the discussion, like I think garbled circuits is a good analogy, at least even for zero knowledge. And I, sorry, to, I didn't mean to interrupt. It's two party and zero knowledge is two party. Like, you know, it's, uh, I think, yes, there are complex MPCs out there, but uh, I'm just looking, focusing specifically on the, on the garbled circuit literature. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if, if I can just jump in, um, oh yeah, you can name it. Um, uh, an interoperable interface is never going to get quite the same performance as something that's specialized. Um, so using the same library for both um, front end and back ends, but that's okay um, because we're making the technology accessible to more people and that will help to improve the technology so that even if you do want to optimize further, you can. And that is where, what connects to, um, to what I started saying about gadgets. Uh, because we allow composition of gadgets, then it would be possible for um, someone to write a highly optimized version using all of those special tricks by analogy to the MPC ones. And then someone else using a simpler subset of that intermediate language, one that is agnostic even to whether the fancy, whether the underlying backend is very fancy and rich or very simple um, in its native language like uh, R1CS. Uh, but then when the time comes to do something like invoke a hash function, it will just make a call to a gadget library. And that gadget library will automatically do the right thing it will, uh, in, in the case where the underlying backend is fancy and supports those techniques, then the gadget library will take advantage of them. So you can abstract away a lot of the local tricks and optimizations. And uh, that, you're right, 
Musu, uh, that does not absolve us of handling the high level frames, like exploiting uniformity and repeating pattern. But maybe we are halfway there to uh, maintaining tight reductions. Um, and uh, this is definitely a place where uh, establishing a working group with people like you who uh, have the full perspective on how this fits the, the different backends uh, is necessary. Um, so sorry to interrupt. Um, the discussion seems great, but uh, Iran and Aurel, were, was there more that you wanted to present? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, let's uh, go to another topic, uh, which is uh, the need for multi-part proofs, which I alluded to earlier. So multi-part part proof, you conceptually, let's say this uh, box here eats a proof. Uh, it's not a snark, it's a proof as a concept with public inputs. And inside we might have multiple schemes that we use for different reasons. Maybe one which is better for R1CS and one which is uh, optimized for uh, Boolean uh, logic heavy sequence, let's say. So we want to use two proof system and sort of concatenate both of their proofs in different formats. And then we have two verifiers that verify each of those. What we have to specify here is um, what are the public inputs to each ones, and there has to be some shared wires. We want to know that the all proofs are talking about the same, uh, the same values. So, so, so very similar, uh, this idea has been uh, well explored in uh, Lego Snark. Typically, the uh, shared wire contain a commitment to a bigger state, uh, which is also kept confidential. So multiple reasons to do that. Hybrid, choose your scheme and to, to optimize it. The other reason is uh, actually something that uh, Moto uh, was alluded to, alluding to. Uh, so you want it to be scalable. So the easy way to make it scalable is to make all the proofs independent and you can uh, prove them independently in, in parallel, maybe on a cluster of provers and then concatenate all the proofs. So it's not succinct, right? The size of the proof is proportional to how many you have, uh, but it's uh, very scalable. Uh, this assumes that you can break up the circuit into multiple chunks in a natural way. So you can find a, a bottleneck in uh, the connectivity of the circuit, so a natural place to split it. And then you have this type of uh, scalability. So we would like to, uh, su to support this in the ZK interface. And that would be maybe a new type of message or flag or parameter that, that says that, okay, this message doesn't contain an R1CS or a circuit, but this message does specify what are the public inputs. It uh, gives identifiers to variables and it says, okay, now we have this other proof and this other proof and they take as input this wire and this one. Right? So we, are, we have a system of uh, variable IDs that will be um, global to, to the system. Yeah. Now we saw that that's what the, the prover have to know. They only have to understand those numerical IDs to know which uh, wire to use. And again, the meta verifier uh, will make sure to use the correct variable, and the correct proof, and call the uh, concrete verifier. So, uh, any question, maybe, or comment about this idea before moving on? Maybe let's finish the whole thing. Okay, okay. Sure okay let's. <coughs> Another need is to execute uh, this software. So as we have more and more um, pieces of software, let's say, that are available, so both in front end and back ends, uh, when we want to automate things or package them or make uh, other people use your work, in some way you need a way to execute it. And it would be very good to have some kind of containerization some kind of standard way to, to execute it. So same idea as Docker, for instance, uh, 
possibly using exactly Docker and uh, specifying the way to execute and what parameters are well known and recognized and uh, saying that uh, the messages are going on uh, standard inputs on the pipe you know, coming out of standard outputs, these sort of things that we can explore, specify it and recommend everybody who is writing uh, zero knowledge software to uh, support this mode so that other people, for instance, the benchmark uh, project of zkproof.org, which was presented uh, last week, I believe, um, can make great use of, of that. So if your uh, backend supports a standard way to run it and then to integrate it in the benchmark is as easy as just copying kind of his name or his Docker URL or something, and then it will run and produce results immediately. So plug and play developer experience and the ecosystem, I already commented on this. So make it uh, very easy uh, to reuse software, especially for new people uh, entering the field. So they can reuse the work of uh, experts uh, very easily, like, like they are used to with everything else in kind of uh, software development, let's say. Uh, and uh, another motivation is, uh, again, the CIV uh, project, which involves uh, uh, maybe a dozen uh, projects, depending on your compute count. And so that's a lot of software that's going to be produced and that needs to interoperate. And we would like to automate uh, as much of it as possible uh, to make it uh, usable, testable, to evaluate it. And, uh, eventually package it into products potential and just make everybody's life easier in general. That's, that's the idea. So we're going to do that by specifying or recommending how to do it, providing libraries, small libraries uh, that just take care of the serialization or talking to the pipe or, or such as just very small vapor to make it more convenient and examples that you can copy to integrate uh, each of these tools uh, quickly, which has been our approach so far. So here are the alternatives. Uh, all of them have been uh, experimented in some way, in some depth. So those are the alternative uh, ways of executing uh, software. So either by comments, the messages can be stored in files, if uh, that's very useful, for instance, for benchmarking, you want to just uh, save the file, have one front end, generate the secret and a test uh, witness, and then you can reuse it many times. Uh, and if you want to do streaming, you use a pipe uh, instead between the two processes. So that's uh, for the scalability of very large uh, statements and saving memory. Uh, we have a demonstration uh, working in WebAssembly where uh, the messages are transmitted just as a, as a buffer in JavaScript. So there is one front-end WebAssembly module that uh, writes into a buffer and then another module that reads this buffer. Uh, we experimented with an HTTP uh, way that was the first ID for the benchmark uh, projects. Uh, but I believe uh, we're going to move more to like automation of comments uh, to be discussed. So that's, uh, that's this concept. So again, to, to achieve uh, this, let's see how it is. In the meantime, uh, you can use uh, ZK interface today and uh, you can contribute. So again, to make it uh, easier for new projects and new applications to come, I hope uh, to have more uh, adapters for more backend, more frontend and Maybe uh, eventually there will be applications that will exist only because it was easy enough and if it was too hard and there was no expert around to build it, uh, people will rely on, on it uh, being available out of the box. So for this simple flow, both front-ends and back-ends, so front-end can export the messages and the back-end imports it instead of their custom format or their uh, intermediary memory structure maybe that they have today. 
that's simple flow. And for front end, they can uh, export themselves. So try to be already a, a catalog of gadgets in a way, which is also very important in these C projects because uh, many uh, teams have similar ideas. So I'm sure they will find uh, common grounds uh, for implementation of uh, reusable gadgets. So be able to publish it and to import uh, other people's. So depending if you write the secret or if you read it and be with us. So everybody, everything is uh, on the ZK interface uh, homepage and uh, it's updated uh, with uh, changes. So check it out. And thank cool. you. Oh, thank you to the speakers. Everyone, let's, you know. Thank you. Clap. Um, great. Cool. So, um, now, uh, yeah, I mean, if there are any more questions, I know there were a lot of great questions already. Um, and we can, you know, discuss both the technical aspects of the work as well as, you know, what um, uh, would be sort of relevant questions for standardization um, here. Aurel, do you want to show sure. the next slide? I think you have some questions there as well. Next one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I mean, um, so now this is more or less an open discussion. If you if you have a question, um, well, depends how many people want to talk. Is there this raise hand feature? Do we have that? I guess we yes. don't currently or need people that. People can just mute, unmute themselves if they want to. Uh, yeah, exactly. People, uh, for now, people can unmute themselves. And um, uh, yeah, so I guess we, we, we touched on this already a little bit. Um, uh, the, you know, there, it seems to be that in these discussions or for these tools, at some point, there's always a trade-off between like usability and performance. Um, do you guys think uh, this is inherent or are we, you know, in, in, in some glory, beautiful future, you know, the most usable tool will also be the most performant one? I think this depends a lot on uh, the, the native language of the leading backends. Uh, with I1CS, we've been fortunate that uh, it, there's really not much to be lost, not much to convey through the I1CS level of the abstraction. Um, it, it, the richer uh, we, we go, uh, the, the, the more we use uh, custom gadgets and non-uniformity and uh, snark adjacent techniques and so forth. Um, the harder it is to convey all the power and all the parameters without um, making complexity unmanageable and even more importantly without make it, losing the interoperability because things become too specialized. Um, uh, I feel that we it, it's a moving target because the best with native uh, native languages uh fluctuate somewhat with what is the state of the art in the underlying schemes um mm -hmm. but that said i am i am optimistic that as long as we stay within the current families of schemes uh there are good abstractions to be found that will not leave a lot of performance by the wayside roadside yeah. <laughs> yeah do you think uh, do you think it's um important for for i guess uh, cryptographers and zero knowledge proof designers i mean you know i think there's been a lot of great work on, on specifically designing proof systems that work well for r1cs um do you think there should be sort of a continued effort in that direction to say like hey it's almost like an additional contribution or at least a part con partial contribution to make a proof system uh work you know for which with R1CS uh, very natively. I, I don't think that constraint should be imposed on proof systems. 
I think that in practice, yeah. uh, it would, it's nice to have a, a, an adapter that lets a proof system consume R1CS because there are useful R1CSs floating around. But certainly if the proof system is heavily optimized and suitable for a completely different setting, then it would be suboptimal, unfair as means of comparison, uh, which leads us, by the way, to the, ZK, to the benchmarking discussion. Uh, and uh, it would also be, um, it, it risks being, um, a, it risks misguiding the developers of the backend into optimizing for, for the wrong things. So just like we spoke about in, in, in the context of benchmarking where a bad benchmark can do real harm, uh, the same may be true here, um, and it is something to be wary of, yes. Okay, are there, there, are there uh, any comments on, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add a comment to this, that I think like the real sort of uh, overhead uh, would, would probably come from sort of if we had to, right, if, if, we wanted, if we wanted to offer, or right, if someone wanted to use a front end that outputs, say, our one CS and really use a back end that has a different uh, a intermediate language representation, right? And then that conversion is really where the overhead, I think, would exist. Um, so uh, so I, if I can give an estimate of the concrete overhead, let, let's say you're doing a scale multiplication a variable base um, and it's a matter of whether you can use a custom gate or not and that's a factor of six overhead maybe so yeah. maybe the the uh, optimistic way to think about it is that someone happens to already have a now one cs the ish implementation in their front end because they used to use the now one cs is ish backend and they now got a great scheme that yes can do six times better but it would be great if they can just plug it in see it running uh, and then uh, optimize from there while doing regression testing and uh, measuring the performance improvements from the different op optimizations and all the good stuff and ideally they would also be able to just uh, switch their say uh, what was it uh, Taylor arithmetic uh, gadget in order to uh, get all of that performance while touching only a tiny portion of a, of their front end generation code. Are there maybe any any other comments on on you know the I like the beyond R one CS uh, comments like you know what constraint system styles are urgently needed. I mean, I, I think, I guess we talked already about Turboplank, maybe, um, uh, maybe Riyadh has some comment on, 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 on the GKR family, you know, which, which often seems to be quite different um, and, and really take, you know, very inherently take advantage of uniformity. So maybe, maybe one comment I have, which is more maybe tied to the second part of the discussion or, or like, you know, maybe they're just mixed up right now, but um, what would be sort of in this top, in this context of beyond our one CS, what would be the languages that people would like to see as part of a, a potential standard, right? And, and I mean, you know, I will go now back sort of to uh, Ariel's talk around direct arithmetization and custom gates and, and, and polynomial um, a, a representation where you know if we had uh, this specific language maybe as a next goal or something like this we could uh, maybe join the right join the working groups i don't know if this is something people want uh if it's even aligned but um it seems it seems like you know i i mean i would be interested if, to hear what people would like to see right what would make zk interface even more useful for people uh yeah. as a first sort of step so, so i don't so Ariel's proposal was proposing to specify the polynomials that, um, that, that make up things like custom gates. I don't think that's probably the right level of, of abstraction for an interoperable interface because you, it, it will be very difficult for a compiler to use that 
um, for the reason that I, I commented on before. Um, mm -hmm. You really want the interface to be talking about things like scale multiplications, like um, uh, uh, hash function um, yeah. applications. I mean, the, the nice thing is that there is, there is sort of a larger growing family of um, zero knowledge proof systems that really are kind of these these polynomial proof systems that uh, rely just heavily on, on kind of where the cryptography is all in a polynomial commitment and um, everything else is. And the nice thing is, you know, you can use that, like, you know, you can use Starks in that way. You can use, use like uh, the pairing based things. You can use uh, on an order group things. You can use bulletproofs in that way. Like, you know, all of these proof systems at least fit um, in that framework, whether that's only like maybe currently the hot area or whether that's uh, here to stay is, is I think is, is still unclear, but there's definitely very, it's, it, it has very interesting and good properties. So. So that doesn't necessarily help you in this situation though, because um, the problem is, uh, let me think about how to describe this. Um, you have a, a proof system which is partly universal. So um, you have to fix um, the custom gates that you're going to use uh, and various other things like the width of the um, for Turbo Park, for example. Um, so you have to fix some things about the meta circuit and then you have to get the, the front end compiler to understand what you've done in a sense. Um, so even if different systems are all configurable in the same way. That doesn't mean that they're configured in a way that is useful for the front end. Yeah, um, I, I think I understand what you mean, but I think that, I mean, I think the high level answer is that, yeah, I mean, it would be that seems like a very, very interesting next candidate for, for this tool to, to implement, right? And it would also show the, uh, you know, supporting more than one thing is always a, is, is a big step always, but it shows sort of that, you know, it shows you modularity. Um, so so something that is thing. really when, helpful is that there are actually only a few things that we need to very heavily optimize because um, applications tend to, always want efficient hashing and always want efficient elliptic error arithmetic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit restrictive, but um, it's a very pragmatic approach to just optimize those things. That's correct. I guess a little bit in the other direction, um, you know, I mean, when uh, people learn to write programs, they don't learn to write them in R1CS, uh, right? you know, the, the question is, are, is there still a goal towards sort of some higher level? I mean, I guess there's a, a little bit the front end support, uh, support that, you know, or, or that's, a, I guess, the goal of the front ends. But, you know, uh, what is the, like, uh, what is the state and, and, and the thoughts, I guess, of this, this group on, on sort of more higher level languages? I, I don't know how I don't want to hug the conversation, but as long as um, the more general thing is not the bottleneck in your circuit, then you're fine. Um, mm. if, if you can optimize the bottlenecks well, then it's no problem. It seems to me. Sorry, this is beyond. Um, it seems to me like there's uh, we're kind of I don't know. It, it seems like this specification or, or this the proposed specification is intended to be sort of a front-end agnostic thing, right? So like the, the language that, that we, we support kind of doesn't matter, but the thing that, it, right, I mean, obviously it matters in some sense, like it matters to the people who are using it, but but the the goal seem, here seems to be that this thing can support any uh, uh, language in the front, um, which, which is great, um, except that it, it seems like by the point that we're in, you know, that we we're looking at the output of the ZK interface front end, um, a lot of, I mean, I think this speaks to uh, uh, Dyer's uh, concerns as well. A lot of the higher level uh, semantic information is lost. And this immediately means that some, uh, like some decisions that were taken during the compiling 
are now sort of done forever, right? Like, yes, this thing is semantically equivalent to uh, elliptic curve scalar multiplication, but if the backend can't sort of surmise that, oh, this, you know, set of million constraints is trying to do a scalar multiplication, and I actually I could do that better a different way, which I, I don't think we expect a backend to be able to surmise that kind of thing, um, then, then we've clearly lost something. So, but maybe that's okay. Like, I, I don't expect my like when I when I have a binary compiled on my computer, I don't expect that I can somehow just like magically like transport some of it to an FPGA and have it execute it faster than my computer could, right? Like I have to do something at, a, at an earlier stage of the compilation pipeline before I can expect to get that out of it. But I think what all of this speaks to is maybe there is room in this format for some uh, uh, information like some meta uh, information about like oh this is the semantic piece that corresponds to this concrete output and maybe that would be optional like if all we have is r1cs yes we can that's sort of least common denominator we can ex evaluate that but if our back end is able to take advantage of uh, sort of uh, some optimizations in certain pieces of it then having the higher level semantic information sort of tagged along with the um, the R1CS or whatever the intermediate uh, transport is, uh, maybe would be useful. Um, so I'm not sure the extent to which that's already supported, but maybe this would be a way of sort of l allowing backends to extract a little more um, efficiency so, without saddling the, you know, other so formats. I, th I think we might be able to use the fact that this is an interactive protocol so that the front end can basically um, ask the back end, what can you do efficiently? Um, and then not compile those things to something at R1TS with people. Yeah, I, yeah. I'd like to chip in if that's okay. Cool. Um, so just kind of along the lines of what you've all, last few things have been saying. Um, I, I'm reminded of like the analogy with um, things like vector instructions and other intrinsic instructions that you see in sort of C language or something. Um, there have been phases where uh, people worked hard on getting compilers to just recognize scalar uh, sequences and instructions and loops and, and automatically vectorize them uh, and do other things to sort of dispatch them. And, and then eventually GPUs came along and, and then people thought, well, forget about that. Why don't we uh, just write at a high level explicitly what parallelism we want? And then it swung back and, and now people um, tend to write in a style, which is my suggestion, which is sometimes uh, if, if performance is a thing and you also want to write generic high level code, what you say is, does the back end support a vector like this, a scalar like that, a thing like that, or this peculiar like primitive, in this case, it might be a hashing primitive or a polynomial primitive of a particular kind. If it supports it, I'll take this branch in the code. Otherwise, I'll take this other branch in the code. Uh, and you see that a lot in high performance code where it, it makes a, a typically a compile time decision, but it's written as a conditional in the code. Um, and both branches are supposed to be equivalent if the author got it right. But one sort of spells out in details how to work uh, on, a, on a less capable back end. The other explicitly effectively makes what Mamanta function calls or something saying, yes, I want this special feature to be called here. Um, and and that, that reminds me of what you just said about tagging. Um, basically, it's, 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 yeah. If you write things in terms of things that look like function calls or special classes or, or special primitives, uh, that's a great thing to pass down as far as you can all the way down the layers that will accept it. And then where, they, where there's a layer that doesn't understand, you elaborate it into simpler versions. Uh, and, and this conditional code ends up being in libraries rather than application code. Um, preferably. Typically, yes. Yeah. So it's not that bad in practice. Okay, so the, um, I don't know if people saw this, but there's the the, um, the working group uh, on ZK proofs, which you guys should all join. Uh, I think Daniel posted the chat and the link. Uh, so you should all join them. Uh, do we have any more, you know, the, the any more comments on, on, on the, the fourth point here, form of verification? I mean, I think that's a, Obviously, you know, really, really interesting and exciting goal uh, that a tool like this, uh, an interface like this could, could, could provide, you know, where it ideally formally verifies things. Is that just a, a pipe dream or do we, 
do we think this this might actually <laughs> happen at some point? I, I think it's feasible. I think it's feasible. <laughs> One thing that we may want to think about, this is certainly very far from what I know anything about, um, but it, it, my understanding is that in, in certain cases where we're trying to do formal verification of some sort of high-level expression versus a low-level implementation of that expression or what is supposed to be that, um, it, it can be, th this, this attempt to make things better uh, can be sort of hampered by uh, having a gross mismatch between the higher level semantics and the lower level semantics. Um, so in particular, uh, it may be that um, having or not having some, some specific uh, thing in the low level semantics uh, would make formal verification very difficult or something like this. So uh, I'm, I, I, again, I preface this by saying it's not really my area, but, but there are people who probably do know a lot about this um, and it would be worthwhile to, to speak with somebody, I, I would say, in, in, who knows a lot about this, to think about like what are the kinds of semantic constructs in the low level uh, representation that are dangerous from a verification perspective or alternatively things that we shouldn't leave out uh, because they, they would, you know, we would be hobbling ourselves. Um, so I, but I guess I, I, I can maybe speak. I, I, can maybe I, speak. I, oh, yeah, I can maybe just speak to that because I've done a few experiments just formally verifying SNARK programs. And I mean, this is partially just due to my, you know, this is being the sort of style of formal verification that I'm familiar with. But in my experience, um, it's a lot easier to uh, give a, a formal semantics to something that looks like a programming language or that looks like functions and like a functional, you know, sort of like a functional programming language or sort of like a, uh, you know, it, it, there's sort of like an easy semantics that you can give just in terms of non deterministic functions or just relations or whatever. Um, and it's clear, you know, how to state, uh, you know, the correctness property that you want and so on with something that's sort of as low level as just, you know, adding constraints to a constraint system, it's, it becomes, I think, more difficult to uh, give, to, to really describe the semantics um, and, and the properties that you want to prove your implementation correct against. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense in, intuitively, I guess. Um, there's an uh, alternative, um, so there are sort of two, maybe more, but at least two related questions here. One is exactly, I think, Isaac, what you're talking about, the, the question of um, proving sort of that, I, I, my understanding was proving that these constraints meet some formal semantic uh, definition, right? Another one would be proving, for example, that this compiler always correctly compiles, you know, from this source language to that target language, um, which is, is sort of a, it, it, you know, it's nasty in the sense that it's a for all <laughs> rather than, than a, a single instance of it. But on the other hand, um, this is the sort of thing where I, I was maybe, I should have been a little more specific, where I was worrying about um, the, the underlying representation, maybe making that kind of proof of a compiler's correctness uh, more difficult. Although, as you say, even the case of proving a single instance of compilation correct probably is already extremely difficult and something that we should be thinking hard about. Okay, I think oh, it's already 6.08 UTC. Um, so does uh, anyone have any more comments? Otherwise, I think, you know, we've passed the time. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. I'm sure the video is gonna go up somewhere, right, Daniel? Can you talk yes, about yeah. that? Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you first to, uh, I guess, the speakers, but also to Benedict and Isaac. Uh, thank you so much for putting time. Thank you to Mary for uh, being such an awesome note taker. I, I want to say that this, to me, it was, it's almost magical. We've had 12 discussions and we've got 12 note takers. You know, I mean, there are some several multiplicities uh, here and there, but it's very much appreciated. I mean, uh, every, every single uh, time we were like, you know, is there going to be a note taker? You know, thankfully. So um, thanks. Thanks to everyone involved. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording, but I think if anybody is interested, as we usually do, to continue discussing, uh, we can totally do that. So.
Tack, Jitana.